All right, welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. Today we are going to do a recap episode of the Women, Race, and Class by Angela Y. Davis, the book we just concluded reading. This episode is going to come out about four or five hours later than I would like. Uh, usually try to release these episodes at 8 o'clock a.m. every day, but what has become a, a regular occurrence or a reoccurring theme with uh, the Rafa Reading Daily podcast series is that the recap episodes usually come out later than 8 o'clock a.m., and uh, that's something that I'm working on trying to better, uh, better be more efficient at or better, uh, better the the release time of that. So, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to try to keep this between 30 to 40 minutes. And we're just going to have a, a deep dive in different aspects of the book, women, race and class. I think first thing I'll start off by saying is uh, this is the second book I've read by Angela Y. Davis. The first book I read was freedom is a constant struggle. And just as freedom is a constant struggle, uh, enlightened me, on very many things and as I was reading it it was like every page was uh, new information and the same thing and I was a sponge soaking up that information the same thing rings to be true with women race and class through I don't think there was a full uh, I don't think I went through an entire page of this book where I did not gain access to some type of new information there were some things that I had surface level understanding of that Angela Davis did deep dives on that gave me a, a a greater depth of understanding or a deeper understanding. And then there were certain other things that I had no thought, no understandings about or no, had never been informed about that. She gave me a surface level understanding about that. I, I hope to uh, expand as I continue to uh, engage in this journey, struggling against police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And as far as the aspects of, the specific issues that we're facing or that we're dealing with as an organization in the May 30th Alliance, the issues of police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. Uh, the racial injustice part is the main dynamic that this book touches on. I want to want to start off with chapter one, chapter one, the legacy of slavery standards for a new womanhood. The first thing I think about when I look at that chapter and reflect on some of the things I read in that chapter is the the concept that was presented by Angela Y. Davis, that there was no uh, room for male supremacy within the confines of chattel slavery in this country uh, because black women were expected to bring in just as much cotton as black men were expected to uh, because black women dealt with the same type of physical abuse that black men were uh, would have to deal with. Uh, and so there was no uh, discrepancy because uh, some women were slaves that they had that they didn't endure uh, the physical uh, the corporal punishment or the, the physical abuse. There also was there also was no uh, it was not an easier. The tasks were not easier. The things were not uh, the way Angela Y. Davis, uh, Angela Davis puts it is that there was no exception or no exemption for what they could or couldn't do because of the fact that they were women. Uh, also, Angela Davis speaks about how important uh, important of a role that black women played in the household during slavery and how even though they may not have done these exact things that the men did, everything that they did was deemed to be just as important and just as pertinent to the uh, family structure and to the household and to the uh, community. Uh, as something that she juxtaposes to the white women who existed during that time who were becoming more and more uh, uh, who were becoming more and more being relegated to being inside the house or being relegated to not having jobs or not working or not having employment, at least for the, the middle class white women who were would have been the majority of the white women who would have been in a position to have slaves and uh, engage in slavery. Uh, she also points out the fact that uh, women had a, a unique experience within slavery that the majority of men did not have. 
uh, when it came to rape and sexual assault that uh, on top of being expected to bring in to do the same amount of work as men on top of dealing with the same physical uh, abuse as men they also had to deal with the extra threat of sexual abuse they also had to deal with the extra uh, threat of being uh, impregnated from that uh, sexual abuse and that sexual violence and and that's not to say that there were not black men uh, who also dealt with sexual violence. I'm sure that that is something that is also uh, that was also the case. Uh, but again, it will be a, a much disproportionately. It will be women dealing with those things. And one of the things Angela Davis talked about is how that was. How that sexual assault, that sexual violence was less about uh, passion and was more about control. It was more about uh, an instrument or a tactic that was used to control not not solely just the black women, but the uh, entirety of the black people who were uh, or, that were in slavery and that were enslaved. And to me, that was something that was I had never really uh, processed the thought of the fact that there was no room for male supremacy within slavery, that anything a man, a black man was expected to do as far as workload. So was a black woman expected to do when it came to workload and how that would uh, greatly change the perspective that you would have to have for uh, uh, black women as a, a black person, whether it be a black child or a black man watching those things, uh, as opposed to, you know, when you uh, grow up in the society, a lot of times the one of the things you hear, you know, is certain things you do for women. When a woman, woman comes in, you stand up from the table or a woman leaves, you stand up, you open the door, hold the door for women. Uh, don't let women carry things that are uh, heavy, you know, things. And again, these are societal things. I'm not saying that this is something that is right or wrong. I'm just talking about that when you grow up in a society, the type of connotations that certain things have or the type of uh, norms that are sort of that are in existence. And those norms didn't exist for uh, black women uh, during slavery. And I think that that's important to point out because it lets you understand how those norms really have never existed for black women, that the the type of things that are that are you expected to do for women or that women, the type of things uh, women are expected to not have to deal with or not to endure has not been the case for black women. That is uh, so that those that was something that I thought was. Uh, very enlightening. And I think that a lot of these concepts should be extrapolated out. And this is what I sort of do when I read something about something that went on in the 1600s or in the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1900s, uh, even early 2000s. I think about what the residual effect of those things are uh, currently and in the time and space that we exist in now. Uh, and so that's those that's one of the, the first things that stands out to me from that first chapter. Uh, then when we go to the second chapter, the anti-slavery movement and the women and the birth of women's rights. I've never read the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. I've heard a lot about the book Uncle Tom's Cabin is something that's I don't know if you can be a, a black person in the society in 2021 and not have some type of inkling of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Even if you don't know Uncle Tom's Cabin as a, a, a piece of literature, the terminology Uncle Tom is something that has been used regularly. And I found it interesting uh, that Angela Davis attributes uh, a, a, a rise in abolitionist ideology to the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. And because of some of the realities that were uh, portrayed in the book and how that shifted people's perceptions of slavery. But one of the things she also talks about is how some of the things in the book fed into stereotypes of uh, of black people and how just as imp uh, important as it was to shift people's ideological beliefs of slavery, it also was important because it, it deeply ingrained other negative stereotypes about black people. And for me, one of the things that stood out about that is uh, the importance of art and the importance of literature and the importance of entertainment and and getting messages out and and helping to shift ideology and helping to shift what uh, what the norms of our society are. And I think that that's something that you can look on uh, human existence since the, the since the beginning of of arts and since the beginning of entertainment and since the beginning of literature and, and writing. And you can see how multiple times uh, 
uh, pieces of art or pieces of literature have been integral in shifting uh, perception and shifting ideology. Uh, but also what comes with that is the da- the dangers that literature and art can play in cementing people's perceptions or cementing people's uh, uh, prejudices uh, and things of that nature. And so for me, that was from the first passage of chapter two, that was the thing that stuck out the most for me. Uh, also, in this chapter, we learned a lot more about uh, Frederick Douglass's stances. I believe I believe it was in this chapter we learned about Frederick Douglass's stances. Actually, this might be that. Actually, this is the, that's the third chapter. But uh, the Grimke sisters, we learned about the Grimke sisters in here. I think that when I think about this second chapter, the anti-slavery movement and the birth of women's rights, this was the beginning of learning names and learning some history about women's rights and Uh, the women's liberation movement that I didn't know about. Same thing, learning things about the abolitionist movement that I didn't know about. Uh, I think that uh, Lucretia Mott was another name that was uh, brought up in here that we learned about. I think that for me, one of the important parts of this book was sort of the timeline that it took on, where sort of it begins at the inception of the of the country inception of this the the uh, united states of america and it as by the time you get to the end of the book it's in the 1970s and i think that that progression that you see throughout these things goes to uh cement the fact that for every two steps that would be taken when it came to black people's rights and uh there would be f- three steps back taken or four steps back taken. And the same thing would go for women's rights. Whenever it'd be two steps taken forward, you would see three steps back being taken later or four steps back being taken later. And when it came to class, because these things are broke down in women, race and class, when it came to things, class struggles, you would see class struggles take two steps forward only in time to see three steps back be followed by that. And I think that that is one of the uh, most damning parts of our society of our country is how often steps forward have been followed by uh steps backwards and uh, and within this chapter you also learn about how uh, the women's liberation movement and the women's rights movement be, uh had its had a lot of its roots in the abolitionist movement in the abolition in the struggle for abolition of slavery and how a lot of these women who would become integral and be big pieces in women's rights movements and women's suffrage, the first movements that they were involved in or the first struggles that they were involved in were the anti-slavery struggles and abolitionist struggles. And I think that for me, one of the things I've learned regularly throughout this last year, these last two years of immersing myself in, in, in the, in this information surrounding Uh, police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice is just how important black liberation movement has been in this country and how the there has not been any type of movement, any type of uh, movement or moments in our history that uh, black liberation and the struggles for black liberation, whether they start out from uh, the abolition of slavery, which even the abolition of slavery had connections to the American Revolution. Uh, And then if you get it forward to where we are now in 2022, where police terrorism and mass incarceration are the biggest issues in our society. And those issues are directly connected to the black liberation struggle and are directly connected to the type of experiences that black people have in our society. And so even when you get to the women's liberation, one one of the things that pointed out is here as well is when you begin to learn about labor struggles, that all of these things have connections to the black liberation struggle and to the experiences that black people have in this society. And I think that for me, that is something that I didn't, I didn't really understand uh, the, the deep connection that the struggles black people have had, how they deeply connect to the struggles that every other group of people have had in this uh, country and in this society and how the continuation of black people struggling has also led to the continuation of, of other sets of people struggling because of the fact that uh, the black struggle is the uh, uh, black liberation struggle is women's liberation struggle. Black liberation struggle is uh, uh, LGBTQIA plus uh, uh, liberation struggles. It is uh, labor struggles. It is 
uh, struggles against mass incarceration and police terrorism. And so I think that all of those things were uh, that specifically was a reminder in chapter two uh, of the historical importance of the black liberation struggle and how that has deep connections to women's rights struggles. Then when you get to chapter three, class, uh, chapter three, which is class and race and the early women's rights campaign, you begin to see how class, different classes of women and different races of women were either benefiting or being hindered by the women, women's rights campaign. You begin to see how as the abolition of slavery becomes closer and closer to being a reality and, and once it becomes a reality, how white women become white middle class women specifically become divided with the people who were once their allies. Uh, in this chapter, you learn a lot more about Frederick Douglass and Frederick Douglass's beliefs when it came to uh, women's liberation struggles. You, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is somebody that's uh, learned about in this chapter. Uh, in this chapter, you hear, you read and learn more about the Grimke sisters, Lucretia Mott. I believe Susan B. Anthony is also mentioned in here. Uh, I think for me, the most, and, you know, not to be, of course, this is a book that's specifically about women's struggles and women's experiences. And I think that the things that should be highlighted the most are women's struggles and women's experiences. But for me, it was also important to see Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois, the uh, the percept the ideology that they had when it came to. Uh, women's suffrage, women's having the, women were having the right to vote when it came to uh, women's equality and women's uh, equity and uh, when it came to issues around discrimination towards women and seeing uh, and here they speak about how people call Frederick Douglass the I don't know what the the, the right terminology is, but he would they, they talked about how he was one of the most uh strongest advocates for women's rights and women's struggles and how at first he he didn't he wasn't necessarily on that side of history and after having conversations with Susan B. Anthony he began he, he changed his perception and he went onto that side of history and I think that that's something that's important because too often whether it's Frederick Douglass or W.B. Du Bois or any other historical figure you're only given the mainstream version of what they stood for and what their beliefs were and what their uh, ideology was. And this was the first time I, I learned about Frederick Douglass's or, or read about Frederick Douglass's stances when it came to uh, women's struggles. And the first time I learned about W.B. Du Bois stances when it came to women's struggles. And I think for me, it uh, cemented the importance of not separating what uh, struggles for black women's equality or black women's equitability from the struggle for black men's equality or black men's equitability. One of the other people that was brought up in this chapter was Sojourner Truth. They had a, a, a speech from her anti, or they had an excerpt from her anti woman speech, which I thought was very powerful and very moving. And uh, I'm just looking through here real quick. And so those are some of the things that stand out to me from chapter three. Uh, when we get to chapter four, racism in the woman's suffrage movement, we begin to see the the deep struggle that was had between black men getting the right to vote and white women having being allowed the right to vote. We get to we see illustrated perfectly how politics work, where they were not willing to give everybody across the board, the country, the government, the, uh, society was not willing to give everybody across the board the right to vote. They were willing for one more group to be opted in to be able to have the right to vote, uh, whether that group was going to be black men or whether that group was going to be white women. It was not going to be both. And to me, that goes to show just the, the manner that this uh, our political system divides groups of people who are subjugated and marginalized against each other. And so the real enemy should have been the uh, white men who were gatekeeping the right to vote. But instead, the enemy became for white women. It became black men. And you see how Susan B. Anthony, who was an abolitionist and multiple other white women who were involved in abolitionist struggles began to 
pull away from being connected to black people and being connected to the black liberation struggles, how they began to go down to the South in an effort to uh, stir up white women uh, and to stir up white men to, 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 to get legislation passed for white women to vote. And the way that they did that was by saying that if you let white women vote, we'll be able to cancel out the black men that's going to be able to vote. That white women who were red and, and, and educated, uh, that, they would, that they were more deserving of the right to vote than black men who couldn't read and then immigrants who were coming over and who couldn't read. And a lot of the ways that they did that was by feeding on racial prejudices and by feeding on racial biases. And, and so to me, that was one of the, one of the other things that that highlighted is the split and the division between the women's rights struggles and women's suffrage struggles and black rights struggles and, and black uh, suffrage struggles. And Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony began to sort of have differing opinions. Uh, and I think that that was something that was important to point out. And, and to me, just the a reminder of how many white historical figures who are celebrated in this country have histories of racist ideologies, uh, have histories of racist beliefs and who espouse those racist ideologies and racist beliefs at a time when at a time when espousing those things was very damaging and damning to uh, black people. And uh, that's probably the just the main thing from women's suffrage movement, the chapter about women's suffrage movement that stands out to me. Uh, here I'm going to I'm trying to I'm looking through the book I'm looking through chapters and we're at about 21 minutes here I want to it's specific chapters that I do want to point things out on so I'm going to jump around here a little bit but one second okay I I believe that the chapter chapter six education and liberation black women's perspective. Uh, to me, that goes to pointing out just the the inherent struggles that existed for black people when it came to them trying to better themselves, when it came to them trying to uh, be self self deter self determination, and for centuries it was illegal for them to black people to learn how to read to to educate themselves and to be literate. And once slavery had ended, once the, those, the shackles of that was off, there was a, a deep desire for black women and black men, black boys and black girls to uh, learn how to read, to uh, educate themselves, to better themselves. And this chapter points out how many roadblocks that white society put up for those things. They speak about how, uh, White society didn't want women to be educated, especially didn't want black women to be educated. It speaks about the risk that other women had to take in an effort to educate these uh, black women and these white women. It speaks about the risk that uh, uh, white women took and that women in general took. But specifically, a couple of these spoke about white women, the risk that white women took in in educating uh, black children and white children in the same classroom. Uh, this chapter spoke about the the importance that black people played in the public school systems being built in the South and how many uh, white people from the North were coming down to the South to help build these schools, uh, to help uh, teach these uh, black people, these ex slaves. Uh, and in the, in the, and because of such an effort being undertaken to help teach these ex slaves and to help teach these black people, uh, just every to teach them, uh, educate them in general. There was also a residual effect that benefited uh, poor white people as well and working class white people as well. And I think that that's something that this book highlights uh, perfectly is how often that things that benefited black people had the residual effect of or things that that benefited the masses of black people had the residual effect of benefiting working class and poor white people. And. I think that that's something that I've learned a lot uh, from throughout these 
two years again of immersing myself in information is how many specifically because the masses of black people from the beginning of the society or from the beginning of this country to now the masses of black people who have lived and who have existed and had experiences in this country have lived and existed and experienced things from a working class or a, 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 a poor standpoint and so when you do things that benefit people that the masses of them are in a working class or in a, 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 a position of poverty, other people who are in working class and positions of poverty also benefit from those things as well. And to me, that was a, a just a, another review or a reminder of how important it is to articulate that things that have historically been done to help black people have not only helped it black help black people or have not solely helped black people that there have always been residual effects that have benefited every uh every other group of people in this society uh but again that to me that chapter also points out just the psychological trauma that has to be highlighted when you speak about black people trying to gain education when you speak about black people trying to uh better themselves and and we know that the type of education you have will have a, a, a direct impact on the type of employment you have. And that will have a direct impact on the place that you live and the type of living conditions that you have. So when you have this uh, this never ending cycle of black people being the disincent disincentivized to be educated that means that they be uh, become in a position to be less likely to have better employment besides the fact that they were already being uh disallowed to uh, to take take part in employment in certain places uh so you have you don't have adequate you are, are hindered from getting adequate education which hinders you from getting adequate employment which hinders you from having adequate living circumstances which breeds things like violence which bleeds breeds things like crimes in communities which breed things like substandard living conditions and then you have children who go through the same cycle over and over again and i just think that again that was something that was very important to be pointed out uh, in this book and specifically uh, the fact that not only were black, not only did being black make you deal with this, these is these evils, these issues, but being a black woman made it even worse because it was even more difficult for women to be uh, educated. It was even more hindrances and roadblocks when it was women who was trying to get, uh, get education. Uh, okay. And then, they speak about here uh, working women, black women in the history of the suffrage movement. And just in general, I think that it's important to speak about the as as and this is a correlation that is also true in the black liberation struggle, not only just in women's the women women's liberation struggles, but. When steps forward were being taken throughout this book, you hear about steps forward being taken. You hear about things being changed or things being uh, handled differently. And the people who gain from these differences or from these changes or from these steps forward are middle class white women. That working class white women are not the things that they need or the things that are important to them are not put at the top of the uh at the top of the agenda. It is things that's important to middle class white women, uh, that things that would be important to black women were not being put at the top of the agenda. It was things that were important to middle class white women that were put at the top of the agenda. And, and so, uh, they speak about often how the labor struggles that women were dealing with and the labor is specifically in the North, the labor struggles that women were dealing with that the women's liberation struggles or the women's suffrage movement, uh, was not necessarily uh, giving assistance to that or not highlighting those things. They were not highlighting the things that working women were dealing with because of the fact that they were so busy highlighting the things that middle class women were dealing with. And we see that same thing happen in specifically during the civil rights movement, where from 1954 to 1968, which is when most people uh, begin and end the civil rights movement, the people who gain the majority of benefits from uh, token integrationism uh, were middle class black people, were black people who could afford to send there to live in a different part of the uh, city, who could afford for their kids 
because they lived in a different part of the city to go to a different school or black people who are already educated enough uh, to have their uh, to have been teaching their children so their children could be in a position to be able to go to uh, these to these white schools and or or black people who uh, had been college educated and who had degrees and who because they were black, they weren't being allowed to move up in the ranks or move up in the uh, in, 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 in employment ranks. Uh, what have you. And once some of these token integration acts began to happen, uh, those doors began to open for them. But for the masses of black people, uh, those changes were not happening. Those benefits were not tangible for them. And so the same thing is true here, that for the masses of of women, these benefits that middle class white women were uh, starting to see take place and manifest they were still not tangible for them that these working class women were still not getting paid adequate pay compared to their white <coughs> their white male counterparts or that black women were not still or women of color were not getting adequate pay compared to their white women counterparts or to especially to their white men counterparts and to even black men their black male counterparts and i think that's something that has to be highlighted when we begin to speak about uh, when we begin to speak about struggles, when we begin to organize and we begin to mobilize, uh, that we have to highlight the importance of, 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 of gaining tangible benefits, not just for a small section of people, not just for uh, a small group of people, but for the masses of people. Uh and then I think that the, the two chapters that were not only the most powerful for me, but also the most enlightening and uh, probably the, the most difficult to read as well were chapters 11 and chapters 12. Chapter 11 is entitled Rape, Racism and the Myth of the Black Rapist. Chapter 12 is entitled Racism, Birth Control and Reproductive Rights. And both of these things. The first, the chapter 11, Rape, Racism, and the Myth of the Black Rapist, highlighted how, highlighted the type of sexual violence that black women have historically dealt with in this, in this country and in this society, uh, specifically at the hands of, of white, white men, and how that type of sexual violence that they have dealt with, how it has not been highlighted, how it has not been something that has been at the forefront of of uh, what what uh, Angela Davis was speaking about was the right movement, how the black experience, the experiences of black women was something that was marginalized when it came to sexual assault and sexual violence and how in uh, part of the reason that it was marginalized uh, to such an extent is because of the propagand propagandistic actions that were taken by the right movement to uh stigmatize black men as being more likely to commit rape than white men were uh, to uh, an effort that was done in criminalizing black men as rapists. So that way lynchings could happen and people would be uh, more acceptable of the lynchings. They spoke about in here, multiple white women who uh, would write books about rape, who would, uh, be involved in organizing around issues of rape and how racist ideologies would be espoused by these women and how those racist ideologies not only went to not only damaged and was uh, black men and was was leading to black men being lynched and black men being killed, but how it was also delegitimizing the experiences of black women uh, who were being raped by white men and who were having no and had no recourse to deal with those things. And uh, and, uh, and of course, Angela Davis, you know, articulates and writes about these things much better uh, than I'm speaking about them now. Uh, and really this this episode, these episodes where we do these recaps are all of these episodes are just as much for for me learning and for us learning the other people who are who have read and partook in some of these episodes along with me as it is to help for whoever the listener is to learn. But these specific reviews I sort of do to. Uh, force myself to remember the things that I've read, to recollect the things that I've read and to find a way to 
articulate those things in my own words and to find a way to correlate those things to uh, other pieces of literature that we've read and to the struggles that we're engaging in uh, overall. And also, hopefully, if somebody listens to this episode before they've listened to episodes of me reading this book, that will lead to them reading the book themselves or lead to them going and purchasing and reading the book themselves. Uh, or I guess I could say listening to it themselves is what I want to say the first time. And then chapter 12, racism, birth control and reproductive rights. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, I'll probably close this episode here after this. But to me. I think one of the things that stood out the most to me was how Angela Davis spoke about the importance of women having the ability and the right to choose what they uh, to choose to have a, a child or to not have a child. And how uh, if women were pregnant, excuse me, if women were always pregnant, that they that women were struggling for the right to be able to uh self determine I think self determinants is the word I think I'm looking for, but they were struggling for the right to determine for themselves what would happen to their life and the trajectory of their lives, and that they wouldn't be able to a struggle for that right or to uh engage in in that right or to what's the word I'm looking for to act upon that right if they were pregnant all the time and if they couldn't choose when or when not to have children and so Angela Davis speaks about the importance of the uh, struggle for birth birth control and all the things that that entails. And uh, in this chapter also, Angela Davis speaks about eugenics and the danger that uh, eugenics had on black women wanting to be connected or wanting to have any type of relationship with uh the birth control movement because of the fact, again, there was racist ideology being espoused by uh, the women that were involved in the birth control movement that as they were trying to advocate and get more people on their side, one of the uh, concepts that they began to push at the top of their platform was this idea that only the right people should be having babies. The idea that, uh, that birth control would stop so many black people and people of color from having children. So that way the white race could begin to have more children and the, and that the, this idea of doing this to help, help the race or to help save their race. And, uh, and so that and even just poor people, one of the things they spoke about is how poor people should be having less children. And so we see again, and like I said, is laid out multiple times in this chapter, how in an effort to get what it is that, these uh, specifically middle class white women want for themselves. They're willing to throw poor white women under the bus. They're willing to throw black women under the bus, black people in general under the bus, poor people in general under the bus. And how that leads to a divisiveness in the movement where it cannot galvanize all the people that need to be galvanized with it. Uh, one of the other things that Angela Davis points out is how uh, Black women wanted a end to the conditions that was leading to them to feel as if they didn't want to be mothers or they didn't they couldn't be mothers or they couldn't bring more children into this world. And how that was just as important as uh, the right for birth control, that black women had the uh, the conditions that would be conducive to them having children and how a lot of the black women were who were uh, engaging in abortions and who were, and I don't shouldn't say a lot, but there was a portion of black women who were having abortions, whether those be uh, self uh, done, trying to do the abortions themselves or going to the doctor, that it was because they just didn't feel like the conditions that they were living in were conducive to having uh, children. Uh, I think one of the things that stands out heavily in, in, to me in that chapter was it was a woman who went to go see a doctor and, had an uh, and had an abortion and uh he she asked the doctor what she could do to uh stop getting pregnant and the doctor said to her uh have your husband sleep on the roof and the doctor walks out and the woman spoke to a nurse who was in the room and said he just doesn't understand but you have to know something that I can do to stop having it, having getting pregnant. And the, the woman nurse says she didn't know what she could do. And later on, the, this, this woman would end up dying from a, a abortion. She tried to come do herself and uh, that failed. And uh, that story has stuck with me since I read it, which was, you know, over a week ago. And uh, I think that a lot of these experiences, these mar these experiences that women have had, these marginalized experiences, uh, should be highlighted and need to be highlighted so people can understand just the the importance and 
uh, and changing the type of dynamics that exist in our society when it comes to uh, women, uh, specifically uh, the experiences of, uh, of black women, women of color and working class and poor women. Uh, and we're at about 38 minutes, 50 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this episode up. I would encourage people to read this book yourself. I can't stuff. I, can, I cannot adequately get across to you the importance of the information in this book from one episode. But I do feel as if we did a good job of attempting to do that through a multitude of episodes that we have released while reading Women, Race, and Class. So please go back and listen to those. After this episode, you will begin to hear us reading Letter from Birmingham Jail. I'll read that along with another member of the May 30th Alliance and dissect that. And then after we read Letter from Birmingham Jail, we will begin reading High Risers. All right. We outside.